Uh, so I'm Phil Brown. I'm the Hawk Watch Coordinator for the Harris Center's own Pac-Man Adnock Raptor Observatory in Peterborough uh, in partnership with New Hampshire Audubon and New Hampshire Parks. And tonight I have the, the privilege of welcoming my colleague and friend, Dr. Lori Goodrich, who's the Director of Conservation Science at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary in Pennsylvania. And she's going to be discussing a brief history of hawk migration study and conservation in Eastern North America. Uh, just a little bit about Lori here. Uh, there's a lot to say, so I'll try to keep it quick. Lori has a long and storied career with the first, as the first full-time raptor biologist, uh, research biologist at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary, where she has worked since 1984. Over the decades, she's been involved in nearly every aspect of conservation-related activities with Hawk Mountain, both locally and abroad. This ranges from managing the long-term data collection at Hawk Mountain and founding the Pencil Pennsylvania Farmland Raptor and Broadwinged Hawk Projects. Um, the Broadwinged Hawk Project is actually one in which the Harris Center is now partnering. Um, and further afield, she has co-founded the Veracruz River of Raptors monitoring project in Mexico, which as I mentioned before, is the world's largest concentration of raptors. And um, through collaboration with other research partners, Lori was instrumental in the development of the Raptor Population Index tool and she heavily contributed to the State of North America's Birds of Prey, the first comprehensive analysis of raptor populations across the continent. So all of her impressive achievements in the world of raptor conservation aside, I would venture a guess that, that Lori has found some, some of her most rewarding work in working closely with the dozens of volunteers, trainees, and graduate students uh, who she has mentored uh, as well as working with countless citizen scientists. Uh, so tonight, Lori is going to be discussing Hawk Mountain's hawk watching history and conservation legacy, and some of the migration focused research conducted there from the 1940s on through today. She'll also highlight the connections between hawk watch sites and encounters throughout their flyway and their contributions to raptor conservation. So let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Lori Goodrich. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, you make me sound great. <laughs> I'm glad that's recorded somewhere. Uh, I'm you know, it's kind of a, a big topic to talk about the history of hawk migration study. So I'm really gonna focus in on the role of Hawk Mountain, the history of Hawk Mountain, and, and how we're hoping to change attitudes for raptors even today by working with partners throughout the flyway. So I'm gonna obviously be skipping over some parts that, um, that hopefully some things that you already know about. Um, this is one thing I didn't try. All right, why isn't it changing? There we go. Okay, so this is a, a wide view of Hawk Mountains Ridge, wide angle view. Um, and what I'm, as I said, I'm gonna talk about is Hawk Mountain, the history, some of the early research that was done on migration science that some of the stuff that we kind of take for granted now as hawk watchers uh, and kind of talk about a little bit of that research, a little bit about what we're doing today and then really focus in on the international connections that we're making. Uh, if you haven't been to Hawk Mountain, we're just southwest of you guys along the Appalachian Ridges uh, here in Eastern Pennsylvania and uh, the view to the north of Hawk Mountain uh, really exhibits what this region looks like. This is the central Appalachian mountain chains uh, with all these series of parallel ridges running northeast, southwest across the state of Pennsylvania. And, uh, but perhaps most importantly, we're located on the Kittatinny Ridge, which is this long, almost 200 mile ridge that, that snakes across Pen southern Pennsylvania. It's uh, a major corridor for migrating birds. It's probably the most, second most concentrated flyway for raptors in Eastern North America. It's been designated a global, uh, national and state important bird area. And the red star there shows kind of where Hawk Mountain is located. We're just north of Philadelphia, just west of New York City and very accessible to lots of folks that wanna come out for hikes and bird watching. The view from the top of the mountain or from a bird's eye view looking back to the north lookout where we do our watches, this rocky out, outcrop to the upper left here, uh, you can see that it's a real spine of a ridge uh, and 
even from a satellite, you see these little yellow arrows, the, ri the Kittatinny Ridge really stands out as it snakes across the landscape. And that's really one of the reasons that we see lots of hawks and other birds using this as a corridor. It has this very prominent ridge, creates all kinds of great wind currents along the face, just like you folks see in New Hampshire. We have great updrafts on windy days. And then we have this line of thermals that are created along the south slope as well. And uh, all of this leads to this becoming a, a major leading line for migrating raptors, which means it, it provides an energy uh, savings for the hawks as they're moving south. Well, Hawk Mountain is more than just a mountain. We are an organization and we were founded in 1934 as a private nonprofit. Uh, really the first sanctuary in the world to be set aside to protect birds of prey. Currently, we have 18 full-time staff, a bunch of volunteers and, and trainees and interns coming and going, um, but lot, so lots of activity. But our mission uh, has evolved from conservation of birds of prey to conservation of birds of prey worldwide. And we, we try to do that through our programs in raptor conservation science and education, and also by maintaining the sanctuary itself as a model for others to emulate. We have three major program areas in Hawk Mountains, uh, uh, in Hawk Mountain conservation, education, land stewardship. We, we own uh, 2,500 acres and we're always working with our neighbors to try to protect more land for raptors and other birds, and of course, science, which I'm in charge of. And just a few stats, again, the view from the top of the mountain, about 2,500 acres of land that we own. We have eight miles of trails. We get lots and lots of hikers and more hikers these days than ever before as people try to get outside. And uh, our counts are you know, sort of average for an Eastern North American site. We get about 18 to 20,000 hawks each fall season. Uh, but we are recording, un probably unbeknownst to a lot of people, we are recording for over 30 years now. And actually since the 1930s, we have data on non-raptor migrants like hummingbirds and snow geese and uh, robins and goldfinches. So we keep track of it, just about anything, monarch butterflies that fly by. And of course, as a nonprofit, it's really important to have that sustaining support, just like at the Harris Center. We depend on our 9,500 9, members and our, the visitors that aren't members, of course, pay a trail fee, which helps us out as well. Well, let's look back in history and, and see where this all began. Uh, in the early 1930s and 1920s, even before that, people were coming to the tops of the ridges in Pennsylvania and particularly Hawk Mountain. It was called Hawk Mountain at that time, uh, not to view the raptors, but to shoot them. And this is a very important, one of three photographs that was taken by a couple of ornithologists from Philadelphia in 1933, I believe. They came up to the mountain. They had read that this was a place they could, you could see a lot of hawks in the fall. So they decided to come up and see if that was true. And they were just amazed and horrified by the number of dead and dying raptors just laying around the mountaintop. So they took, they collected the bodies, um, lined them up, took a couple photographs, and this is just one of them. Um, and this photograph down in the bottom right is an actual photograph of a family from that time period. And that's people sitting at, at top of North Lookout. And you can see it's, it was not, you know, just, it was not just guys that were going up and practicing, getting ready for hunting. Families would come up with their picnic baskets and, on a Sunday and, and shooting was just a thing to do. And of course, we're horrified by that now, but, but the attitudes toward raptors and all predators at that time was that they were vermin, they should be exterminated. So this was not uncommon to be occurring. But anyway, these, these young men, uh, Richard Poe was one of them who was the founder of the Nature Conservancy later on in life. As a young man, he came up and hit with his friend and his brother uh, and they took these photographs and then they took the photographs to New York City to the Audubon Society's meeting as well as the Hawk and Owl Society meeting to try to stir up some interest in trying to stop the shooting of hawks. Well, unfortunately, uh, nobody in the audience or the board of directors of the Audubon at that time felt compelled to do anything about this place in, in rural Pennsylvania. But there was this woman in the audience, Rosalie Edge, who you can see standing next to a, a large, I think it's a California redwood tree, um, 
who had been come, been trained in the suffragette movement in the 19, in the early 1900s and was beginning to start to get active in conservation. She had formed something called the Emergency Conservation Committee, had been active in trying to protect forests and established national parks out west. Uh, but she heard this, this story about this place in Pennsylvania where hawk shooting was going on and decided that if nobody else was going to do something, she was going to do something. Now keep in mind that she was 58 years old at that time. She was from New York City. She was basically a New York City woman. Uh, and I, hopefully you'll find this story inspiring today because it really, if you look forward to what we've what Hawk Mountain has become, and it all can be traced back to this woman's determination and willingness to do something. So she wrote a letter, so she, she drove out to, uh, well first she drove out with her son to this site to see what was going on. It was June when she arrived, so there was no hawks going by, but she did find out from, um, just by chance, that the place was up for sale. So she put down a deposit with an option to buy and in so doing established the first sanctuary in the world for birds of prey. But she knew that she wasn't the person to stand there and tell people to stop shooting hawks. So she hired this young man, Maurice Brune, uh, who was at that time in his early 20s, it was working in Vermont as a naturalist at a resort. And she wrote, she had met him yeah, in Central Park, you know, summers before. And this is an actual quote from the letter that she wrote. We didn't have email back then, so a lot of, hap a lot of stuff happened by mail. Uh, she said, I hope that we can get immediate possession and stop the slaughter of the hawks this autumn. And she said there had been a, never been a hawk century. And she did uh, say that she didn't have any money to pay him, but she would, she would try to raise enough money to pay his expenses. And Maurice immediately accepted. He was recently married with his wife, Irma, and they, came down after the summer season in Vermont and arriving at Hawk Mountain in, on September 10th. And he was a really amazing naturalist. He kept a daily journal of everything he saw, the temperature, the weather, uh, and we have copies of those journals, which are uh, just a resource, you can't believe, of, of information. Uh, but he wrote in his journal on September 12th, I'm keeping a separate journal of the observations while on duty. And when he was on duty, he was protecting the road. He was uh, telling people they couldn't come up the trail with their guns, but that they wanted to take binoculars and walk up, they could. And uh, he mentions that he saw 50 hawks go over the road that day. Well, within a week's time or two weeks time, all of a sudden, Irma, the wife, was standing at the gate telling the hunter or the shooters not to uh, go up the trail, and Maurice was on top of the mountain as of September 30th, recording the daily migration count. He was bit by the bug early, I and mean, all of us having bit by the bug of hawk watching know exactly what he was feeling. He couldn't stand on the road and not see as many hawks as he could see. So September 30th, 1934 is the first daily hawk count uh, that was recorded, and since that day, he, he had himself or somebody up on the lookout uh, September, October, and November of every year, uh, which really uh, cements Hawk Mountain as the first place to really conduct a scientific uh, sampling of raptor migration. We established this sanctuary uh, in 1934. Um, it was 1,400 acres of land. And uh, immediately the goal was to try to protect hawks. And to do that initially, it was through education. So. Maurice was an excellent speaker, so he did lots of talks at Rotary Clubs and Lions Clubs and uh, groups all over. But this is an interesting photograph because this is 1936, so only two years after the sanctuary had opened. And look how crowded that mountaintop is. 750 visitors registered for the days, he writes. Uh, so uh, bringing people to the mountain, and people were curious about this hawk sanctuary, so they were coming out, even if they didn't have binoculars, to see what they could see, was really important and a real key step in trying to change attitudes toward birds of prey, which was really, really the focus of the staff and board early on. And from the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, visitation, of course, grew. The only years that we didn't have any staff on site was in the World War II years. Uh, there was no count conducted in those three years because uh, Maurice was off in the Pacific. But um, 
the, the board continued their work uh, and it wasn't really until the 1960s that we saw legal protection for birds of prey that had any kind of oomph. Uh, and then finally in 1972, the reauthorization of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act included all raptors. So uh, from 1934 to the 1960s, there was still raptors being shot up and down in different places and there were still issues. Although by the 1950s, there was largely, most raptors were protected. At least the shooting had dropped tremendously. And keep in mind that Rosalie Edge passed away in the early 60s. So she didn't actually live to see full protection of the raptors, but she did get to see her sanctuary become this, this uh, amazing popular spot. Bay and Hawk Mountain, of course, education remains central to our mission. Uh, we have this amazing view, which draws people in, even if they're not interested in the raptors. And then hopefully they, they see a, a red-tailed hawk fly by close or a bald eagle, and then they get hooked. And that's really a part of what we use to change people's attitudes even today. So um, we, there, over the years, we've been known as a school in the clouds because of this amazing connection people can make with raptors. Um, we, we, of course, have lots of school group programs when, when it's not during a pandemic. And uh, one of our most important education programs today probably for our international mission is our international trainee or internship program. And since 1986, we've been inviting international uh, young people to Hawk Mountain for three, three or four months at a time to work side by side with the staff and learn about raptor migration and how to manage a place like Hawk Mountain so that they can go back to their own countries and hopefully uh, invoke the same thing there. So over 70 people from 75 countries have visited over the years, over 450 trainees, and I'll be coming back to that later. Here's a map that shows the extent of the, the trainees that have come here. A lot, of, lot from the US as well. Right now we have five people from Pennsylvania because we're not allowed to have international students, but 47% of our trainees have come from other countries. So the research that we're conducting, I want to just uh, go back in time in 1934. This is Maurice Brune at the North Lookout waiting for the raptors in the shade. You notice his clicker. It's one of the old style clickers. Um, you know, our, our, our technology hasn't advanced that much into recent days. We're still using clickers, uh, although we do have a tablet now at the Lookout to record our data. Um, so he was up there. He, was having, he had volunteers cover days when he couldn't be there. Uh, every day in the fall. And really today we're doing the, the data is collected pretty much the same way, as I mentioned. We're using volunteers, we're using staff, uh, we cover the lookout every day from, now we've expanded the season a little bit from mid-August to mid-December, but uh, the, the, the uh, technology hasn't advanced that much. Our binoculars, of course, and scopes are probably better, but um, the visibility is probably lower. So maybe it all comp falls out in the end. Um, so one of the quotes that Rosalie Edge had early on when we were really in the throes of trying to protect raptors was the time to protect a species is while it's still common. And we really, uh, when you think about Hawk Mountain's research program, our scientific program, it really is centered on this, this idea. We are not working with uh, California condors or highly endangered birds. We're, we're monitoring populations and trying to detect changes before they get too, too severe. In addition, we're trying to study the birds, try to understand uh, why, if they are starting to decline, why that is before we, things get too, too severe. So one of the early um, research, I'm just gonna highlight a couple of projects over the years that uh, Hawk Mountain kind of put on the map um, in our migration science. And one of the, the publications that Maurice Brune put out in, the, in 1935 was a publication of the Hawk Counts for 1934, the first field season. And these are the numbers, nothing too amazing, 10,000 birds or so. Um, but he recorded 39 golden eagles. And immediately that caused an uproar among ornithologists because at that time they, they weren't supposed to be any golden eagles in the eastern United States or eastern North America. So, but he recorded these eagles and caused uh, 
little stir. Everybody assumed he was misidentifying bald eagles. And uh, of course, the next uh, fall season, a couple of ornithologists from Philadelphia came up and lo and behold, there were golden eagles flying by. So this was really the first uh, verification that there was an Eastern population of golden eagles. And later on, you know, other researchers located the breeding populations up in Quebec and Labrador. Well, the other uh, thing that Maurice uh, immediately was queuing in on was when do hawks concentrate? You know, what, what weather conditions? So he published several papers, and this is just one of them on weather and hawks. And of course, we all know that now, cold fronts, we, you know, we all want to be up on the mountains and cold fronts pass by or on ridges or coastlines or in this springtime, we want to be in warm fronts. Uh, but in 1951, Maurice published the first um, treatise on this, on this topic. And in, in 1943, he did a really neat study that you still see cited today where he ran a telephone line from top of our mountain out to another lookout about 10 miles down ridge, if you can imagine. And uh, he had a friend out there on the phone. You can see this is the phone at North Lookout here with Maurice on the one end. And they would get, he would make a call when he saw a unique bird going by, like a golden eagle or, or any, you know, red, even a bird, like a red-tailed hawk. And then they timed it. And they published this paper uh, on the flight speeds of all these various species. And you still see, if you look at the birds of North America counts, you still see them citing this flight speed study, um, even today. Jumping forward to 1973, uh, Hawk Mountain staff made a, a huge contribution to um, to all raptor watchers by publishing a flight guide to raptors in flight. Uh, before that, we just had the Peterson guide or some other things to try to identify raptors. And you know how difficult that can be. Of course, today we're very lucky. We have videos and we have probably six or seven excellent flight guides that we can all refer to to try to identify these distant specks. But we didn't have that back in the 60s and 70s. So this flight guide was really when I first got into hawk watching um, in the 1980s, you know, to, to get a copy of this, you know, it was out of print. Everybody would compete with each other to get their hands on it for the day, just so you could understand what was going on. Or you Xeroxed it and took it out with you. Um, one of the first um, uses of hawk migration data for uh, monitoring populations or for, or for reflecting populations occurred in the 1950s and 60s uh, when Maurice Brune wrote in the newsletter about bald eagle populations and how they were uh, declining and, and not only declining in number but the number of uh, young birds was declining. And he was looking at this kind of data here uh, where you can see on the bottom is the number of eagles per hour flying by Hawk Mountain. You can see in the from the 1940s through the early 60s, a real plummeting in the number. And, but the most interesting thing was he noticed he had been aging the eagles even back then, and he could say that the proportion of juveniles had really dropped from the 30s and 40s to the, to the 50s. And during that time, Rachel Carson was a member of Hawk Mountain, and uh, she was a biologist in Washington, DC. She would come up on weekends, and she was writing this book, Silent Spring, about the impact of DDT on everybody, on people as well as wildlife, and asked if she could use the data. So if you go into, if you have a copy of Silent Spring, this is a very important book about the impacts of DDT on the environment. You can see the citation of Hawk Mountain's data in, uh, in there. In addition, leaping forward, in about 1990, we published a paper, uh, the first anal scientific analysis of migration counts at Hawk Mountain as, as indicators of population trends. And why was this important? Well, I know you're gonna be getting a, a talk um, from Phil later on about how we're using migration counts all over the continent now to, to, as an indicator of population trends, a very important project. But at that time in the 1980s and 90s, a lot of scientists that are, in, that are wildlife scientists were skeptical that migration counts could be used to monitor trends. So this paper kind of put that answer to rest because it looked at several birds like the sharp shin Cooper's hawks and the eagles to show that um, known declines uh, resulting from DDT use were showing up in the migration data. Therefore, the migration data do represent real population trends. 
So Hawk Mountain's mission is raptor conservation. So I wanted to just talk a little bit about how we're working in that. Uh, obviously, long-term, the data continue to be used, uh, integrated with other sites, as mentioned um, before, with the raptor population index. Um, but what else are we involved with? Uh, I did mention the trainee program as a really central and, and growing part of our our mission to conserve raptors worldwide. And if you think about it, we're 18 full-time staff, only four of them are scientists, three of them are educators. You know, we're not gonna be running all over the world making a huge difference on our own. And the, really, the only way to make a difference is by collaborating with others. So we continue to collaborate with those 450 trainees that are all over the place uh, to try to uh, augment and improve conservation for raptors in those different areas. So the trainee program, which is a four month training program, brings people from all over. This is uh, Yiwa, who is from Taiwan, and uh, uh, you, you, Luca, who is from Bulgaria. So people really are coming to Hawk Mountain from all over the place. Um, in addition, I wanted to just reflect on the fact that if you look at the Hawk Migration Association map of Hawkwatch sites as of, let's say, 2014, you see this amazing number of little red dots all the way down into Mexico. But if we had a map, and I couldn't find it for this talk, but in 1990, you would find very few dots south of, the, uh, south of Texas and very few around the world. Uh, Hawk, for Hawk Mountain and all of you folks that uh, broadwing hawks are one of my, our most numerous migrants, uh, these birds are traveling long distances. They're leaving North America, going into Central and South America for the winter. And we were really not knowing much about what they were doing once they uh, departed the US. Other species that uh, also do long distance migrants, the Mississippi kites, the Swainson's hawk as seen in the upper left, peregrine falcons and turkey vultures also are long distance migrants. And as an organization interested in raptor conservation, we know that once uh, things, that although we have legal protection since 1972 for raptors here, uh, that's not necessarily the case in other countries. Uh, we have severe habitat loss, uh, rainforests being cut down south of the border, and of course, of course, DDT is still being used in some areas. So there's lots of challenges for these birds. So we wanted to uh, really try to implement conservation through collaboration in other areas within the flyway. And of course, birds are still being trapped for trade as well. Um, and in 1990, uh, we knew that there are big flights in Israel and also in Panama, but not much else had been studied. So uh, in 1990, we welcomed a young man, Ernesto Rallis, from Mexico, and uh, we worked, decided to work together collaboratively with Hawk Mountain, Hawkwatch International. This is Steve Hoffman from Hawkwatch International here, and this is Ernesto, uh, to try to uh, establish the first migration site in eastern Mexico. And this site is located here. You're going to learn more about it in, in a subsequent talk. Uh, it's right where the Sierra Madre Mountains converge on the coastline in, along the Gulf of Mexico. And Ernesto at that time su suggested that from his friends and he watch watching birds in that area, they thought maybe it, this was a big, con big concentration uh, site for raptors, maybe a million birds going through there. He wasn't sure. This is just a view of what it looks like in the countryside, very rural area, a lot of ranching and, and uh, sugar cane, that kind of thing. We set up a project, we, re we received a grant from National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and later from the Fish and Wildlife Service and conducted counts for the first couple of years in the early 1990s to try to document both the pattern of migration to understand what threats were being, uh, were facing the birds and also to begin education programs with the public. These are some of the count sites we set up in the spring of 1991 and also in 1992 in the fall. And of course, uh, conducted counts with two or three observers at each site. And, uh, you know, there's a photograph of, of, of um, the kinds of raptor flights that we were, that they were seeing immediately. And I remember in 1992, I was sitting in my house at, at night. Uh, we were, Hawk Mountain was getting ready to count 
its millionth raptor after 50 years of counting, or more, 50, more than 50 years of counting. And we were having some big contest, you know, guess the day when the bird comes by and you get a prize. Um, and they called, the folks from in mid-September called up from, in 1992, they called up on the phone and said, we just counted a million birds going by Veracruz. So immediately we knew that this was a world-class site. And over the years, the estimates are on average about four and a half million raptors of about 30 species going through. And you'll learn more about that uh, in a future talk. Um, wide variety of species, of course, but the big numbers are broadwing hawks, Swainson's hawks, and Mississippi kites, and turkey vultures, and pretty, pretty much 95% of the population of broadwing hawks are going through this site. But most important was the education program that we started, because at that time, hawks were still being shot uh, in big numbers, and there was a general lack of knowledge about the migration. So we started full-time education programs, which are now going on to today and being led by former Hawk Mountain interns. Uh, this woman in the middle here, Yume Cabrero, is the education coordinator for Veracruz today. And this is a photograph of her at Hawk Mountain. So lots of good stuff going on. They, they were able to raise money and build a first bird observatory. Uh, and we, we still exchange interns and trainees back and forth, and we're continuing to collaborate. Uh, so now Hawk Veracruz is on the map with, as the most numerous hawk migration site. But we've also added with another trainee or intern, the Ismith of Panama, where we, uh, there were counts early on, estimates of around a million birds going through Panama, but with a more complete count, uh, we can estimate uh, over three million birds are going through Panama as well. This is just a summary of all the international sites, at, in this flyway at least, that have been started by Hawk Mountain interns or trainees. The Veracruz River Raptors, there was a, a several year count in Bolivia, the Kekulde site in Costa Rica, which we're probably going to be starting up again either next year or the year after. Uh, Panama was initiated and that by a trainee, is now being maintained by Audubon Panama, but um, initially it was done, was conducted by Hawk Mountain tra trainees. And then um, Belize is not one of our sites, but that's a new Hawk Watch site in the region. And then Columbia was just added this past spring and is being, uh, and some sampling is being, being done as we speak. And we've also had former trainees start count sites in Georgia and the Philippines as well. This woman here, just another example of international reach to give you is uh, Esther Vallejos from Colombia. She was a trainee in the fall of 2019. This is a photograph of her at North Lookout. And I really liken her back to a young Rosalie Edge. Um, she came in with huge determination to change things in her own country. And she spent a lot of her non-lookout uh, time when she was in the office writing grant proposals to try to raise money to try to uh, start a hawk count and education initiative in Colombia. So she started last spring in oh, the spring count uh, in southern Colombia, this area here, and now she's hoping to start something, a fall count in the northern reaches of the, of the uh, country. And you can see as birds come through uh, this region of Panama, Costa Rica, they're get, the flight corridor gets really narrow. And as they come into Colombia, there's all these mountain ranges. So uh, birds kind of split. They, some birds go to the, to the east into Venezuela and some continue on south. Um, this is a photograph of the Imbege which, Imbege, which is where she counted this spring. And this initial count was a preliminary count. I was also uh, started initiation of education efforts and training uh, volunteers uh, was supported in part with a grant from Hamana and uh, so also some funding that Hawk Mountain raised from our members. And she started in early March with a count. And if you can remember what was happening in March, uh, you can imagine what was happened there. But uh, she, initially she did some training workshops with the local uh, students to try to get folks to help out with the count as well as to help out with education programs and schools had a pretty good turnout with, with people interested. Uh, right now there's a huge surge of interest in birding in Colombia. So there's lots of excited young people interested in uh, doing something with birds. 
So they started the count March 1st. On the left here, you can see this um, nice scenic place to conduct a count. But um, in mid-March, the whole country shut down because of the COVID uh, situation, and they were forced to remain in their apartment. Well, fortunately, their apartment, this is uh, Esther in the apartment, is actually only a mile away from the count site. So um, they were able to continue the count, even though the visibility was slightly uh, reduced. They, they, they kept the daily count, then they all lived in the same apartment. There were four of them, and they just rotated through. So they recorded some data. Of, um, this is just a seasonal count from March 2nd through mid-April, and you can see they recorded about 250,000 broadwings, 140,000 Swainsons, and, and some other birds, ospreys and peregrines and so forth. Uh, if you're interested in the exact numbers, um, she is writing an article for the Hamana newsletter, so that'll be out hopefully in the next issue. But one of the key things that was is so important down there is that hawk shooting has become more and more popular. It's not becoming less popular as we would think. It's becoming more popular because the villages in the mountains of the foothills of the Andes are all competing to see who can shoot more hawks. And in the spring, this is all associated with the, with the Lent season. So one of the things that uh, Esther really felt uh, gratified about was that she was able to make connections through their all their volunteers getting out and talking to the folks in the villages, uh, kind of a network, word of mouth network to, to find out where the shooting was occurring. And although technically it's illegal, uh, you know, it still go on, it used to go on and the police wouldn't pay attention. But all of a sudden, because of all the, the interest that she had stirred up, the police started to take notice. And this is a actual arrest of, of two gentlemen that were shooting hawks. And this is the evidence here. These are two Swainson's hawks that they had shot. And of course they, certainly had shot others, but this was the evidence that they were arrested with. So she felt really good about this because it was a sign that maybe the time, time was turning and the, and the uh, authorities were gonna pay attention. So in the fall, um, she's now looking for a site in uh, Northern Colombia, probably in this region of Antioquia. Um, she had hoped to be closer to Panama, but there's a lot of unrest there and it's not really safe. So she's looking in this area here and we'll see whether what she comes up with. The country just opened up, so it's probably just gonna be a preliminary season this year and more in depth next year. So back to Hawk Mountain. So those two antidotes, you know, a little snapshot, Ernesto Arales, former trainee, really making a difference. Esther clearly making a difference and going to make even more difference. And we're seeing that with our trainee program. Some of the folks that come through here really are fired up and they, they may not have many resources in their country, but they, they find a way to make it happen. So I'm gonna wind up here with a little bit on what we're doing with our research today. Um, I'm not gonna talk too much about it, but just to highlight, uh, of course, we're continuing to monitor our populations. We're particularly concerned about American kestrels. So we're starting a long-term or a multi-year research project in collaboration with folks from New England and all the way down here to Pennsylvania and New Jersey to try to understand what's going on with American kestrels. We'll be doing some contaminant analysis and trying to figure out uh, why they appear to be declining. Uh, we're, we, have anal we have collected these data on non-raptor migrants for many years and we're getting ready to analyze those data for a scientific publication. So that'll be kind of exciting to look at some of the patterns we're seeing in some of these other birds like hummingbirds and loons, of course, and come over here. Uh, but a lot of other even common birds like American robins, we have good data on. Of course, um, try to understand migrating birds, it's really important to try to get more detailed information on what they're doing because just observing them as on a snapshot when they fly by the lookout isn't really telling us around their, about their migration ecology. So we've been using satellite telemetry for a number of years to study migrating raptors. Um, we're we're going to be we, we're going to be talking I guess in the future about a study on broadwing hawks we've been doing here and we're going to now be moving up into your area thanks to uh, some support from the Harris Center we're going to be tagging birds hopefully next uh, summer or spring in New Hampshire and Connecticut and hopefully learning a little bit more about them 
But we've also been monitoring both turkey and black vultures for over 10 years now and trying to understand these common scavengers and how they uh, behave in migration, uh, as well as during non-migrating non season. And even though they're common birds uh, across the continent, uh, they're declining in all over the world. Scavengers are declining all over the world. So we're, we tried to get out ahead of that with our birds here and understand them really well so we could be ready if we notice any declines. And so we put telemetry units on about 60 turkey vultures over the years. And this is the kind of data we're, we're seeing with our tagged turkey vultures. And the key point here is that birds from different regions appear to be wintering in different areas. So there's strong connectivity. Birds from, Pan, from Pennsylvania and New Jersey are migrating at best down to Florida. Some don't even go that far. But the birds from Saskatchewan are going all the way down into Venezuela. And the birds from the North Pacific Northwest are going into Central America for the winter. So very different migrations and very consistent. One individual going back year after year to the exact same spot. We did a little bit of studies with our trainees going in the reverse direction by tagging vultures with wing tags. And we found that uh, pattern is kind of reversed from, they were tagged in Venezuela and you can see all their wing tags going back up through that central flyway. We're working on black vultures and uh, one thing we'd like to do, we were gonna do again this spring, we didn't do, is to tag some birds up in New York or Connecticut and try to understand a little bit about the migration movement of black vultures. Uh, we're working on snowy owls in the Arctic. And um, that's about it. I'm gonna end there and say that uh, we have a lot going on and I hope I didn't go over my time here, uh, but I'd love to answer any questions you have. And thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Lori. That was that was very informative. There was a lot to uh, to process and to still hear for everybody, um, but it just shows the breadth of research that at Hawk Mountain is leading the way uh, globally, really as a as a raptor conservation leader and education as well. Um, you know, I was seeing some of the similarities between what we do on a small scale at the Harris Center and what Hawk Mountain has made happen on a on a both a local level and and really globally. So um, it's nice to know that we're we're part of this with our little Hawk Watch site here and part of uh, the bigger picture. Um, there were a lot of questions coming in along the way, and we were attempting to throw some answers out there. Um, keep on sending some some questions my way here for Lori specifically if you have them now. Um, but I guess I'll I'll jump in and um, uh, I wanted to. To ask about kestrels, I guess. I, can I start in with kestrels? Um, specifically, what's going on with kestrels? Um, are they definitely declining everywhere or is it a local thing? And have you seen any signs of hope, I guess? I think, yeah, they are declining over wide areas of the east, I think. Um, but there are some pockets where they're doing really well. and. The areas that we see them in Pennsylvania that they appear to be doing, I should say they appear to be doing well. I mean, one of the things we'd like to do with our study is to put small transmitters on kestrels and really understand their survival to see if they're returning year after year to the same um, nesting areas. Uh, maybe they're surviving better in some areas than others. But um, you know, one of the hypotheses is, is landscape related and that areas around here, for example, we have a lot of corn and soybean farms and uh, we're not, our kestrels are not doing well. And then there's other areas where there are a lot of pastures, they appear to be doing a lot better. So whether that's related to food supply because uh, there's a lot more insects and um, you know the food chain is not as disrupted in the farmland there compared to corn and soybean, or whether it's an actual direct impact of pesticides or contaminants. We don't know, and that's one thing we're trying to answer. Um, we're also gonna be looking at um, survival in all seasons. So are they, it appear, right now we know that nest success has remained pretty high in our kestrels, even though 
the, den the density or number of nesting pairs has dropped. So we don't know, are they not coming back in the winter from wintering or are they not, um, you know, surviving the fall migration. So with the telemetry, we're hoping to answer what season are we seeing the greatest mortality. Um, we're also going to try to look at fledgling survival. So uh, we're working with folks in Massachusetts, and I think they're also doing some work in New Hampshire, um, here in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. So I I'm really excited about this study because I think it will help us answer that question and then you know, we can move on to what the next step should be, which is to try to do something to bring them back. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you. Um, and that, that generated a few other questions about some of the chemicals that are being used today. Um, I don't know if you are able to speak to that. Are there any local concerns about things other than DDT? So rodenticides are one possible issue, uh, but the neonicotinoids are something I really want us to look at closely. Uh, they're an agricultural chemical that has been shown to impact songbirds um, or cause death in songbirds. So whether they're having a secondary poisoning issue with kestrels, we don't know. Uh, or is it just that there's nothing to eat in these barren deserts of cornfields for these birds? Um, but yeah, these are the questions we want to look at. Nobody's done that kind of analysis with kestrels or any raptor. So we need to jump in, even though it's not our area of expertise. We're bringing in all kinds of collaborator collaborators who know something about that. Yeah, I'm fascinated by the farmland project that you've been able to uh, achieve in Pennsylvania, uh, such an agricultural state in many parts of the state where you are. Um, around us, maybe it's to a lesser extent, but could there be any potential benefit to throwing a lot more kestrel boxes up in our area? Uh, we've yeah, had absolutely. I, here in town. Yeah, so I, I think um, what I would like to see is, is where you have that good habitat, the horse pastures or the cattle farms, putting up nest boxes. And of course, we down here have probably more Cooper's hawks than you do, but they can be a big problem where you have uh, patches of suburbia or woodland interfacing with farmland. So you really around here need to find grassland habitat or farms that have wide open spaces and then put up a kestrel box. It doesn't mean that they don't do well. We have a box right here adjacent to our building that's around the edge of a wood lot and the kestrels do bring off young, um, but the young are going to have a much better chance of surviving if there's less Cooper's hawks around. Yep. Yeah, well, very locally to the Harris Center, uh, I know Mead Caddo has been watching uh, a pair of kestrels, and I think they raised five young this year. So, uh, they fledged five young, so that seemed like a really good number. Is that right, Mead? You're nodding, okay, yeah. And uh, so that's been a local success story. Um, yeah, kestrel boxes are like, basically like giant bluebird boxes that, uh, that kestrels, which are cavity nesters, will use for those who haven't heard of kestrel boxes. So uh, yeah, uh, that sounds like a great project. So I remember that that Feathers in the Wind book, which I have a copy of, has, no. has the uh, instructions on how to build a kestrel box. Yes, it does. <laughs> yeah, it's a multi-use book. So yeah, pick it up wherever you see it. I'll buy it off you. <laughs> Great. Well, can we talk about broadwing talks for a moment? Since that's the other, uh, that, that's a big species here for us. That's about 75% of the, the fall hawk flight that we see locally in New Hampshire. So um, a lot of people come out for September, as you know, um, you know, our week is probably a few days before the peak at Hawk Mountain, which the birds are moving down ridge and it may take them a day or two or three to get there. Um, so we, you know, we had that peak around September 15th through 20th this year great numbers of broadwings. Uh, it's very exciting. A lot of people think hawk watching is over after that happens, and, you know, because that's, that's the big spectacle. We all like to come out and see the hundreds of numbers together and sometimes thousands, but um, these broadwings. So we're finding out generally where they're starting to winter. This is new information to science that um, is telling us exactly where these birds are wintering. Is there anything you can tell us about um, some recent revelations with that project? Uh, 
Yeah, so we, we've been using satellite telemetry on broadwing hawks, mostly females so far, because they're bigger and can carry a transmitter. Um, but so far we've only tagged birds in Pennsylvania. So we're very excited to be working next year in New Hampshire at the Harris Center properties, as well as at the same time, we're gonna be tagging birds in Connecticut, thanks to some donations from the Northeast Hawkwatch Group and Connecticut Audubon. Um, and why do we want to do that? Well, if you note, if you remember back when I was talking about turkey vultures, that we found very strong migration connectivity with turkey vultures. So birds from different breeding populations are wintering in vastly different areas. And we suspect that might be occurring with broadwing hawks as well. And this has direct conservation implications because one of the reasons we're studying broadwings is we notice declines in their numbers, at least in some pockets of their population. And uh, we're trying to understand why that, what the conservation threats are for this amazing migrant that we all enjoy. Uh, so Pennsylvania birds are wintering primarily, Pennsylvania females are wintering mostly in Colombia, Brazil, and Peru. And these fem adult females and the juveniles that we tagged were, were mostly in Central America. Um, there was three birds that were tagged as part of our collaborative study from Alberta, Canada. And so when we compare what they did to what Pennsylvania birds did, we found that Alberta birds, two of them did exactly what the Saskatchewan turkey vultures did, and they went into South America and went east um, along northern South America. So, and one of the third bird they tagged went down into Bolivia. Um, so those are just two data points, you know, Pennsylvania clustered in, in the uh, western part of so northern South America and Alberta birds being in the, in the eastern part primarily. Um, but we would like to know what different populations are doing. And we also eventually, when transmitters get uh, more functional at the small, smaller level, be tagging males as well, because males return at least here in Pennsylvania, a good week before the females. So are they wintering farther north? Are they going somewhere? Are they just leaving earlier? We don't really know. And, and of course, if you've been paying attention to what's going on in Brazil right now or other parts of the Amazon basin, you know, things are not good for birds that depend on forest in those areas. So uh, there's fires being set all the time. There's massive areas being cut over for agriculture. So habitat's being lost, you know, daily. So the sooner we know what these birds are doing and what areas they depend on, the better we can do a job, the better we can protect them for the long run. Great, well, thank you for your work with that, Lori. That's, uh, we were so excited to be part of that project and hopefully find some nests for you next spring. Yes, um, and I, thank you, you so much for, for uh, being out there this year. I'm sorry we couldn't get up there with all uh, this stuff. Very understandable. Yeah, Eric Masterson at the Harris Center is leading that charge and um, hopefully he'll be out there himself uh, looking again in the spring too. Um, we did find a few nests locally and um, hopefully we'll be able to have that same success next year. But um, for those on, on the call here, maybe we can uh, give you some more information about an upcoming training if we do have another hawk, uh, Broadwind Hawk nest searching training. There was one done in the spring to get people out finding uh, broadwing talks on Harris Center lands. Um, so yeah, last question here, is there a Hawk Watch convention where all the coordinators get together? Um, <laughs> I think Lori knows a little something about that. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Hamana, the Hawk Migration Association of North America is another nonprofit that I encourage you to look into if you're not aware of it. They oversee or the, uh, all the Hawk Watch sites in North America, Canada, U.S. and then South as well. And they do hold, um, not annually, but every couple of years, a, a meeting where they everybody gets invited to come, a conference. And it's a lot of fun uh, to participate because it's just people that love to hawk, watch hawks. So and that's all we talk about. So um, if you can imagine. <laughs> so yeah, Hawk Migration Association of North America is has these meetings. We actually have a regional meeting here and I encourage folks in New England to think about that too because um, we have about 40 people show up 
for our Pennsylvania meeting. And um, it's kind of amazing that people uh, love to get together and just talk about what they saw. Great, yeah, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll get a New England gathering uh, going pretty soon, uh, especially with the challenges we've all had to deal with in 2020. Uh, so comparing uh, how we can all keep hawk watching uh, and, and the research and education strong. Uh, so thanks to, uh, to Hawk Mountain's lead uh, for many of those, those um, uh, reasons to get going. Uh, so that was, that was about 6.30 now. So Miles, what do you think? Are we probably good here? Yeah, that was fantastic. Okay. Thank you there so much. There were a lot much. of good questions coming in. Hopefully we were able to get to most of them. Uh, but I want to, again, thank Lori for being with us here uh, and giving us your time and, uh, and contributing so much information and leading Thank you both. Thank you for having me. It's great to see some folks up there in New Hampshire, and hopefully I get to meet you face-to-face -face next spring. Oh, that sounds good. All right. Well, thanks again, Lori. Okay. Thanks, everybody, for joining us all. Bye, everybody. Good night.